next speaker is Brother Guy Consolmagno of the Society of Jesus. He is from Detroit. Uh, he went to the University of Detroit Jesuit High School before going on to obtain degrees from MIT and the University of Arizona. He was a researcher at Harvard and MIT. He served in the U.S. Peace Corps in Kenya. And uh, this, of course, being the best part of his resume, in my opinion, he taught college physics at Lafayette College before <laughs> entering the Jesuits in 1989. He was assigned to be an astronomer at the Vatican Observatory, where, among other things, he spent time at the South Pole doing meteorite research. He was also on the committee that decided that Pluto was not a planet, so he was one of those Pluto lovers. <laughs> <laughs> He is a scientist who values communicating science with the public, and he is pretty darn good at it. He was awarded the American Astronomical Society's Carl Sagan Medal for Excellence in Public Communication and Planetary Science in 2014. He is the author of several books, including the best-selling Turn Left at Orion, which is here in the library, and which also a lot of people who have come here have had, and he's been autographing those books. He has been a guest on the Colbert Report. And in September, he was named director of the Vatican Observatory by Pope Francis. In fact, when we first arranged for Dr. Consolmagno to come to Louisville, he was not the director of the Vatican Observatory. This is a bit of a bonus that we got. Um, please welcome Dr. Guy Consolmagno. Coming to a typical Sigma Psi meeting, um, I, though I'm still very uh, much an active Catholic, I'm a fallen away Sigma Psi member. <laughs> but if you will have me back, maybe some of the fallen away Catholics can also. <laughs> I was expecting a group of maybe 25 researchers in a small room, and I could show a PowerPoint and I could talk about my research and on the structure of the solar system. And instead, I have all of you guys. And this is marvelous, but it's made me revamp the things I want to say. First of all, for those of you who are wondering why the Vatican has an observatory, <laughs> let me uh, simply ask, not only why shouldn't they, but how come your church doesn't have one? <laughs> stars as reminding you that there are sometimes things more important in life than what's for lunch. <laughs> in addition to that, let me tell you a little bit about the observatory we do have. We're small, we're, our aim is to be small but good, and we've accomplished at least half of that. We are small. <laughs> we have 12 astronomers, all of them Jesuits, one diocesan priest, actually. Uh, but, but it is possible, if rare, for a diocesan priest to be brilliant. <laughs> uh, an example of such would be Father Georges Lemaitre, who came up with what, what is now called the Big Bang Theory. So all of you who think that the Big Bang is somehow an atheist's idea, the atheists were furious at Father Lemaitre for coming up with something that they thought was much too close to the idea of a creation point. <laughs> Among our group, we have people from four continents. We have at least eight languages being spoken, and that's, you know, Father God or himself who speaks all language. We have research ranging from cosmology and string theory to the study of galaxies and galaxy clusters to people doing a census of the stars in our own galaxy to my own work in meteorites and the formation of the solar system to people working on near-Earth asteroids, including the one that we hope doesn't end life here on Earth, but maybe can be mined for a commercial success. So we cover the entire range of the solar system. And the universe, the entire range of uh, the speaker that we just heard, who 150 years ago described the universe brilliantly, except you can tell he was an early Carl Sagan because he talked about thousands of galaxies, <laughs> when in fact there are billions and billions. <laughs> Science has 
an odd place in today's society because there are some people who want to use science as a replacement for religion because science has all truth, and others who would reject science because, you know, every now and then science gets it wrong. Why should we trust it? I once gave in a, a written exam to a group of science students, science for non-majors, and rather than answering the question, one student wrote out at great length how science keeps changing and science is only what the scientists say it is, therefore it's a waste of time, therefore I shouldn't, uh, you know, bother learning this stuff. <laughs> I had to write back in the margin that I really, really appreciated his bravery at risking going out beyond the bonds, but bravery is only a significant risk if it carries with it the possibility of failure. And guess what? <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about my science and my astronomy to show that neither of those two straw men are actually true. That science is a wonderful way of trying to get to know how the universe works, but sometimes it makes its most significant progress when it's almost correct, which is to say, when it's wrong. We're familiar with the idea of the Middle Ages and the ancient Greeks of a round Earth, yes, they knew the world was round, surrounded by crystalline spheres that carried the planets in some odd way. You must recognize that they did not think the Earth was the center of the universe, but the bottom of the universe. Because after all, what's underneath the center of the Earth? The inferno. So when Copernicus comes along and says the Earth is not the center, he's not demoting the Earth. He's promoting it to the same level as the other planets. But this idea of just one world surrounded by crystalline spheres did not prevent other thinkers. Going back to Cicero, who wrote a, a story called Scipio's Dream, thinking about other planets as places where people could have adventures in what some people consider the first science fiction story. If you read that, you will find him describing the motions of the planets in a very interesting way, a way that was carried forward by the Indian scientist Ayabata in the year 400, who describes with remarkable precision the periods of each of the planets in their path through the stars, which is a description you can talk about whether you think it's the sun or the earth that they're going about. And if you look at the periods published by the Babylonians, by the Romans, by Ptolemy, by Aryabhata, you find that you know, his period for Mars is correct to five decimal points. Except for one problem. Um, they didn't have decimal points there. <laughs> In fact, the way he describes the period is to say that the period of Mars, Mars moves through the stars exactly so many years when the Earth moves through the stars a different number of years. And you divide the one to the other, and you get an answer that's good to five decimal places. And he does this for each of the seven known objects, which would be Mercury and Venus and the Moon and the Sun and Mars and Jupiter and Saturn. Those were the seven moving objects in the sky, so important that the ancients named the days of the week for them. Of course, that was superstition. Nobody today talks about Sun Day, or Moon Day, or Saturn Day. In fact, the other days in English are named for the, the German and Norse versions of the gods that anyone here who speaks Spanish, or Italian, or French will recognize. Luna Day, Marte Day, Mercola Day, Mar Moon Day, Mars Day, Mercury Day, Thor's Day, which is Jupiter's Day. Rita's day, which is Venus day. The role of these moving objects, moving in a very irregular way, 
seemed to some of those people to mimic the strange and irregular events in human history. Could there possibly be a correlation between the positions of the planets and the positions of things here on Earth? And if I could predict the positions of the planets, then I could tell you who's going to win the next election or what the stock market's going to do next year. I would have power. And if you pay me enough money, I'll do those calculations. <laughs> well, every planet's motion is known as a fraction of the Earth's motion. Now, those of you who studied fractions in the fifth grade know if you have seven fractions and you multiply them all together, you can come up with the common denominator of which all of the motions of the planets can be seen to repeat. And the common denominator to the Indians was about 4.2 billion years, which they then concluded was mathematical proof that the universe repeats itself every 4.2 billion years. And since what happens on our Earth is controlled by the planets, things that happen on Earth must repeat themselves every 4.2 billion years. And everything that happened before will happen again. All of this based on wonderful science, accurate to five decimal points. <laughs> Not accurate to six decimal points. <laughs> because as we now know, now that we've invented the decimal point, the periods of the planets are not perfect ratios. They are not rational numbers, but irrational numbers. There is no common denominator. There is no time when the planets were all lined up in one position. There is no time when they will all be lined up again. Not to mention the fact that, uh, in terms of, Astrology doesn't really work very well. <laughs> but notice the problem. Attempting to use astronomy to prove a philosophical point fails even though the astronomy is accurate to five decimal places because the astronomy is almost correct. But the astronomy of that time was not exactly correct. There are many examples of astronomers who have made tremendous progress in astronomy with ideas that were almost correct. One of my favorite, living in Italy, was the 19th century astronomer Schiaparelli. Schiaparelli was probably one of the best observers and calculators of his day. He was a tremendous talent, which is to say, I couldn't do the stuff he did. And he's famous for three important discoveries. First of all, he observed very carefully the position of Mercury, the planet closest to the sun. Very difficult to observe because you can only see it just after the sun is set. And so Mercury is really low in the horizon where the air gets very shimmery. But he was able to see a dark marking on Mercury. And then the next time he observed Mercury, the dark marking made it look as though Mercury had not spun relative to the sun. And he observed this over a period of several years and proved conclusively that he was always looking at Mercury in the same orientation to the sun. Mercury always keeps one face to the sun, just like the Earth moon does to the Earth. And he publishes in the 1880s, this is accurate to one part in a thousand. And he says, therefore, the period of Mercury is the same as the year of Mercury, about 88 Earth days. And when I was growing up as a kid, that was in all the textbooks. Then, in the 1960s, we invented radar. And we had radar waves powerful enough to bounce off the surface of Mercury and measure just how fast Mercury really was spinning. And we discovered that it wasn't 88 days. 